Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we come before you wanting to break your word. We ask that you do it. Break it small, pass it around. Let us eat from it and apply it. May it minister to us, direct us, and guide us. And may, O oh God, we represent you as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that you work within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. James Dobson said one time, there are two people in marriage, and both are seeking to have the power one over the other. A fellow wrote in Reader's Digest once, I heard once that marriage is when a man or woman become one. The question is, the problem is, which one? Dennis Fogan, a guy in our office, said, when you have two people together, you have three different opinions. And that is usually the case. It is true that our real enemy is Satan and his minions. It's true that people are not our enemy. That is true. But it seems like the biggest problems and the most significant problems in our life are with people. Things we manage, count, invest, don't argue back, but people sure do. Therefore, how do we get along with one another? Well, in Ephesians chapter 5, Apostle Paul has changed the argument in chapter 5, verses 21 to 33, and he's now talking about relationships. But before we dive into that text, I'd like us to just touch briefly again on chapters 5, 15 through 20. If you look, it says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation or excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Pastor Lynn said last week, that it is not we who fill ourselves with the Spirit, but the Spirit fills us with himself. And as we continue to read, we see that in verse 20, that there are three examples of being filled with the Spirit in this verse. It says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, and giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can group these three things under the heading of celebration. We speak, we sing, we give thanks to God for who he is and what he has done. Our minds are constantly engaged in praising and celebrating God. And if we do that, we are filled with the Spirit. If you look farther down to text in Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul gives you several reasons as to how we can praise and celebrate God. And it's everything that Jesus Christ has done for us. Verse 23, Christ saved us and saves us. Verse 25, Christ loves us and gave himself up for us, resurrected his body so that we could be redeemed. Verse 26, Christ makes us holy. Christ sets us apart for the purpose of living a righteous life. We no longer live in the mud, but we have been washed to live in righteousness. And if we think of everything that Christ has done for us, we should celebrate with psalms and hymns and thanksgiving and celebrate in being filled with the Holy Spirit. If our mind is occupied on all the things Christ has done, I cannot cease to be filled with the Spirit and to praise Him. And that's one thing. It's the vertical relationship we have here. 
in celebration. We're filled with the Spirit because we celebrate who God is and what He's done. And then we have the horizontal uh, relationship in being filled with the Spirit. And we see that in verse 21. And that is that we exercise the place God has given us by submitting to the role that God has chosen for us. And submission is the key word. If you look at the text we're going to study, Ephesians 5.21, it says, And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her with the washing of the water with the word, that he might present himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reverence to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Let's go back to verse 21. And be subject to one another in the fear of the Lord. This also is an expression of being filled with the Spirit, that we submit and subject ourselves to one another. We should celebrate because Christ Jesus chose to submit to the Father's plan. Being subject or submitting means to place yourself under the other. It's a military term. It emphasizes that we are to be subordinate in the role that God has chosen to us. We praise God that Jesus Christ submitted to the role that the Father assigned to him. The Father's role is to be a planner, to be a designer, to be an architect. Christ is not the planner. That is not his role. Christ is the executioner of the plan. He's the general contractor who takes the design of the architect and fulfills that design in building the structure. And that's what Jesus Christ did. He took God the Father's plan and then he carried it out being aligned under God the Father in pure and perfect submission. If Christ did not assume his role of executioner, we would still be in our sins and we rejoice that he was willing to submit. Therefore, celebration, praising God for what he's done and who he is, and being submitted to God for the role that he has given us is the formula of being filled with the Spirit. And if we do that, the Spirit will control and dominate our lives. To have life-giving, meaningful relationships, we submit to the role that God has given to us in obedience and in submission. You have no order in life if there is no authority. And you have no order in life if there is no subordination and submission to that authority. That's where order comes from. 
each performing their own role. In 521 again, the verse submit implies an organizational authority, an authority of someone over the other who's organized and has a plan. And we are called, as members of the church, to be mutually submitted to one another, aligning ourselves under what the Father wants for us. It's voluntary submission. It's not obligatory. God wants us to voluntarily submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and he wants the wife to voluntarily submit her self and her being to the authority of the husband. It's much more meaningful when the wife submits and she chooses to do so than if she's forced to. That certainly is not love. And so the husband not only submits to the Lord, but he submits to the wife. And the wife doesn't only submit to the Lord, she submits to her husband. So being filled with the Spirit manifests itself in submission, in the fear of Christ. And submission is the key to spiritual victory. We always want to rule, we always want to dominate, but God wants us to biblically submit. Mutual submission, therefore, is the reverence for Christ and his church. When we realize that Christ is our head, we do ourselves good when we submit to him. You remember the old Bob Dylan song? We all have to serve somebody. And the key to satisfying relationships is that we understand who we are to serve. We serve the Lord, but we also serve one another. The underlying importance of serving is submitting to the needs of the other. It's not that the husband is always in charge and he's always right. The husband loves Christ so much that he chooses to submit to his wife's wishes, to take Social Security at 66, then rather at 70, even though he knows that it would be a better investment to wait. She feels more secure having the money now, and that is important to her. So the husband submits to the wife's wishes, and he's right to do so. The wife submits to the husband when he wants to take the household in a different direction. He's making good money at the bank, but he's not fulfilled. He wants to be a physical therapist. He wants to leave his work and go back to school. And she endorses that and submits to that. Things change. Life gets harder. But she chooses to submit. Those are two examples of mutual submission. We could give many others. Calvin said, No one ought to free themselves from submission. And where love reigns, there is mutual servanthood. Kings and governors rule that they may serve. Mark 10, 45, our Lord stepped out of the glories of heaven to come and serve, not to be served, and to offer his life as a ransom for others. So we have this attitude of mutual submission. Believers do not insist on getting their way Husbands are to have a submissive attitude towards their wives and often put their interests above their own. And wives are to submit to their husbands and often she puts her husband's wishes above her own. That's how the relationship works. John Stott asks, what does it mean to submit? It is to give oneself up to somebody. What does it mean to love? It means to give oneself up for somebody. As Christ gave himself to the church. Thus submission and love are two aspects of the very same thing. Namely, that selfless, self-giving love is the foundation 
of an enduring and growing marriage. We love our wives. She submits to us. In essence, it's the same expression of love and submission to the other. God has designed for the man and woman to have different roles. One role is not more important than the other, and both roles are needed. And for the marriage to win, both roles need to be understood, and the husband needs to understand the wife, and the wife needs to understand the husband. You know, when the Apostle Paul wrote these verses in Ephesians 5, I kind of get frustrated. I get equally frustrated when I read 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1 about the role of elder. Paul sets the bar so high that a husband has to be the very image of Christ. How is that possible, I say? And at times I feel like I will never be able to reach that standard. And the wife has to submit in all things to the husband, which is a difficult task as well. I think as we approach this text, we need to have the idea that I heard on a Focus on the Family broadcast several years ago. He said, approach your marriage as if it were a 10% stretch. Don't try to accomplish everything in one year. You'll never make it. There's too much to do. You have a lot of work to do to change you. But try to do something to improve your marriage at least by 10% every year. And if you take it in small bites and pieces, maybe at the time when you're 85, your marriage might be okay. And hopefully it is. The oil that we should use in our machine of marriage is the oil of forgiveness. And we should have an attitude that whatever we do in marriage, it is lubricated and it is prayed over and it is submitted to forgiveness. Archibald Hart said one time, forgiveness is giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. We are all hurt in marriage. We treat our spouses worse than we treat our friends. We say things to our spouses we would never say to someone else. And sometimes it's unbearable. But we need to have that posture of forgiveness in our marriage. And I think we should try to remove every speck of vindictiveness, the one-up, getting even, I'm going to make you pay attitude, and that of resentment and unforgiveness in our marriage. If we would approach it like that, I think we would be better off. And then I think we need to be learners in our marriage. There was a famous book a while back called Fighting for Your Marriage. They talked about the four ways that we negatively communicate to one another. And if we would strive to stop communicating in these negative ways, it would improve our marriage. First one is escalation. Open the refrigerator. Why didn't you put water back in the refrigerator? Well, do you do everything right? And then pretty soon, starting from a little comment, we go way to the top over a silly issue of putting water in the refrigerator. And escalation can damage our marriage, and we need to stop that if we can. And then there's invalidation. I think this is the worst one. It's speaking to the other person in contempt. It's disqualifying him. Whatever she does, he's on her. Her tone is contemptuous, it's scolding, it's um, as she's the mother and he's the son, or he's the dad and she's the child, 
And that attitude of invalidation or disqualification can ruin a marriage. You water a plant with that type of water and you'll kill it. And you speak with contempt to your spouse in and out every day, you'll carry your marriage. And that's something that we need to try to avoid. Third one, we have an example of this every day, is negative interpretation. It says that the news agencies 99% of the time interpret what Trump does in a negative way. He has a healthy constitution, but if you do that in marriage, it's going to destroy it eventually. And we need to remove that negativity that we have sometimes in our marriage context. And then, if we don't like to fight anymore, we take our toys away and we go home and we isolate ourselves in a room and we withdraw, we distance ourselves. And so we should strive as spouses to reduce those negative ways that we speak to one another and that would make a big difference I think in our marriage so the wife submits to Christ and assumes her role of submitting to her husband the wife submits to her husband because she's in love with Jesus Christ and out of fear and respect for Christ she voluntarily assumes a subordinate role the church is never forced to submit to its head. Christ never, support, uh, never forces the church, and the wife should not be forced to submit. It's a picture of functional subordination. There cannot be two heads. One has to line herself up under, and functional subordination does not equal inferiority but it emphasizes harmony. It emphasizes unity. It emphasizes the best that there can be. And the wife needs to realize that if she doesn't submit, she's not going to be punished by her husband or rebuked by him. It's the Lord who will do that in his time and in his way. It's amazing to me, if we switch sides here, how many men have misused verses 22 through 24 to exert control over their wives? We saw this especially in Italy. It was way out of balance. In that culture, and in many culture, the men are taught to be little kings. They are the authority, and they walk into the home, and they say, Submit, woman. And they want the woman to do everything for them while they do absolutely nothing or little to nothing. And we need to realize, husbands, that we conveniently gloss over our responsibilities to be like Christ in the marriage, which is much more difficult, and we concentrate on what the woman doesn't do and we fail to do what we should be doing. And so we need to concentrate on that more. The wife does not submit to her husband if the husband wants her to sin. Because Christ would not force the church to sin, and the wife does not submit if she's asked by her husband to do something that's unbiblical. I also believe that in the context of marriage, if the wife is physically abused, even psych psychologically abused, and she is treated as something less than an equal partner in the relationship, that there probably needs to be a separation. And the wife needs to be under the tutelage of a godly pastor and a trained counselor. And the husband needs to be accountable for his actions of how he has misinterpreted the word of God. And they need to try to place their marriage in the right relationship. Christ would never submit the church to that type of abuse. On the other hand, uh, oftentimes the woman does not marry Prince Charming. He's not good at everything. He is not kind. He is not like Christ in every way. 
but she still has a responsibility to submit to him even if he is a two-legged rascal he may not be perfect but she is his and he is hers and she has that responsibility to submit the wife needs to know her husband and the better she knows him the better their marriage will be she knows that men need respect men do not need love they need respect and in this text the scripture says that the woman is to respect her husband two times because men need to feel that they are adequate that they can do things that they have an ability and a significance to offer and men need that especially from their wives women need to know that men are insecure despite that they think that they're in control and they're tough inside they are soft and fragile women need to encourage men but they need to find a way that the husband appreciates their encouragement they don't need to encourage like they've been taught but they need to understand how the husband appreciates being encouraged and if she does that she'll improve her marriage she needs to know that men want more sex every day every minute that's what they think about your sexual desire for your husband affects his sense of well-being even when you're not in the mood it's important for a man men men are visual and it's just the sex for a man to see you in something skimpy than in seeing you in nothing at all and that needs to be known and men care about your appearance they don't care if you're a size 3 but they want you to take care of yourself they don't want you to look like an unmade bed and that's important for the husband the husband submits to Christ and he assumes his role of leading the wife and the husband loves the wife you see a quote says rarely do we see an exhortation to husbands to love their wives outside of the New Testament context. The word agape, unconditional and self-giving love, does not appear in any extra-biblical Greek rules on the household. They don't know what agape is. But that's the type of love Christ commands men in which they are to love their husbands. One would think that if wives are commanded to submit to the husbands, husbands would be commanded to rule their wives. It is an asymmetrical relationship. Wives submit, but she is not exhorted to love him. She's exhorted to respect him. Husbands love, but he is not exhorted to rule her. He is exhorted to love her. Paul paints three pictures here about Christ's sanctifying love. Number one, Christ loves the church that he might sanctify her. He died for the church. He cleansed it with the gospel and the word. It's a picture of Christ's sacrificial death and the cleansing of sin that come from his shed blood and his atoning death. Number two, he washes and cleans the church to present the church to himself as a glorious present and offering to himself. Christ alone prepares her. Christ alone presents her. Christ alone sanctifies her and receives her into his glory. And the picture is that the husband does the same thing to his wife. He prepares an environment where she's safe, she's clean, she's healthy, and that her glory becomes the glory of the husband. And three, 
that she might be holy and blameless. Christ is the skin doctor here. He presents him, her to himself without spot or wrinkle, blameless, so that she can be all that she can be under the authority of God. During biblical times, the groom, after two years of engagement, would go and pick up the wife for the wedding. She would do several things. She would take a ceremonial bath and cleanse herself as good as she could. She would anoint herself with oil. She'd place ceremonial garbs on her, embroidered white linen, beautifully stitched and ornament and perfect. She put uh, fruit or flowers or something in her hair as a crown that she's giving to her husband. Her husband comes and gets her, and on the way he picks up friends. There's musical instruments playing, they're singing, they're dancing. They pick up the wife, they take the wife to the groom's home or to the father of the groom. They say their vows, and then they party for two weeks. And they have a great time. But it's the picture that she's being sanctified that she's being cleansed, that she's been separated for her soulmate, and he is giving himself to her. It's a picture that the husband provides an environment for the wife where she can thrive, where she is in her element and she's growing. He is to love her with what is sometimes termed Calvary love. No higher standard is conceivable. And so the man needs to know that the women need to feel loved. It ceases to, to amaze me, but I hear this all the time, that a couple returns from their honeymoon and the wife looks into the eyes of her husband, newlyweds, and asks, do you love me? The husband is down, dumbfounded. What do you mean? We just took our honeymoon. What do you mean, do I love you? But for her, she needs to know in every moment of the day that her Prince Charming is deeply in love with her. And it's not anything to dismiss. She needs that repetition. repetition. We understand women are emotional. Men need to know that women have emotional thoughts that are past and present and sometimes future in their minds all at once. And men need to know that who lack emotion. They call me an emotional flatliner. So you can tell how well that works in our marriage. <laughs> and women want security. She needs emotional security, not only financial security, but she needs to know that her man is there and is protecting her and loves her with all of his heart. She doesn't want the man to fix it. She wants the man to listen to her and to take the time to engage in an adult conversation without thinking about sex. She doesn't want as much sex as her man, but she wants as much affection as he can give. And he should concentrate on being affectionate and then leave the sexual part as it follows. She wants to look attractive, but even when she doesn't, she wants her man to love her. Even though she may not be a 10, she knows that she is his queen. And so Christ viewed the church as his bride, as his own body. The husband loves his wife as he loves himself. He nurtures her and cherishes her. He nurtures her emotionally, physically, intellectually, and spiritually in every way. It is natural for a man not to hate his own flesh. 
He nurtures it and he cherishes it just as he has commanded to love his wife. How do we win at relationships? To have life-giving, meaningful relationships, we submit to the role that God has given to us. When you see a marriage done God's way, when a husband truly practices loving actions sacrificially towards his wife, and a wife voluntarily submits her will to her husband, you are reminded of how Christ sacrificially loves his church and how the church at its best voluntarily submits to Christ's leadership. When it's done well, it's a beautiful thing. And hopefully we will strive to that. Do you see I'm not talking about control? We're talking about the opposite of control. We're talking humility, selflessness, love, putting others first. All leading to beautiful unity in our relationships. And our model is how Christ loved the church. How do we win in relationships? To have life-giving, meaningful relationships, we submit to the role that God has given to us.